Uh, we are live. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome. My name is Emilio Garcia from Boundify. And in today's webinar, we will be discussing uh, how to increase value and reduce cost through marketing automation. I have here with me today, Stefano uh, Gasbarino. Uh, Stefano, it's a good friend and a channel account manager for HubSpot. And, you know, is he is an expert on this topic, and I'm really, really glad to have him today. Uh, Stefano, how are you? I'm great. How are you? You're in uh, sunny Boston. Yes, in sunny Boston. We were talking about that yesterday, right, Is the, or a couple of days ago. I wouldn't imagine that Boston would be a place where you will hit, you know, anything above 90s, but, uh, yeah. but you do. We get pretty extreme weather here, from cold to, to warm. Um, but, uh, summer's dying down, so we'll get to fall, fall soon. Nice. Very well. Well, Stefano, um, uh, hopefully we'll have a couple of questions during your presentation. I will try to make it interactive. Uh, some of you that have been on the webinar before, or if you're seeing this on demand, um, you know that you can make questions at any moment if you want to, and I will try to relate those to Stefano. Um, there's going to be a handouts or of the presentation uh, shortly after. And uh, yeah, if the, if uh, Stefano, you're ready, let us start. Awesome. So let me share my screen here. Great. We are seeing it now. Can you see it? Yes. Awesome. Let's see if this charges. Can you see it? Awesome. Yes. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Stefano Gasbrino. A little bit about myself. Um, as Emilio says, I work mostly with our uh, channel team, our, our partners, um, US, Caribbean, and as well as Latin America. I'm a senior account manager at HubSpot, been at HubSpot for almost five years now. Um, please, if you guys have any questions, please, please do let me know. What are we talking about today? Um, we're going to talk about segmentation of your database, why that's important, how to segment your database, uh, when you guys, when, when companies today are going to start generating leads, how to nurture those leads, and what kind of automatic processes you can start building out um, for your business. So the agenda today, um, firstly, we're going to be talking about how to segment your database using a matrix that um, we use here at HubSpot, mostly focused on fit and interest. I'll get into that in a few minutes. Secondly, we're going to be talking about lead nurturing and how to align that best with the rest of your everything in marketing, sales, service implementation, as well as account management. Then how uh, these leads um, you can start measuring certain important KPIs, for example, CAC and LTV or cost of acquisition and lifetime value and why those KPIs are really important for you as a business to measure. Lastly, we'll end with a few best practices of marketing automation. Like I mentioned, if there's any questions, let me know. So when you as a company are starting to attract leads to your website, it's really important to start segmentating those leads. So you can have that personalized communication and outreach um, so to your leads. Why? Because every lead, every prospect is different, right? Um, and it's really important to know much more about that customer. Um, when you're going to start segmenting your database, there are different ways to do so. Um, you want to segment your database for a number of reasons. One, so you can start to understand your prospects and your customers more, so you can tailor your content as well as your outreach to the specific needs and challenges. Secondly, you really want to improve your customer experience by really treating every lead. Different example, uh, I spoke to an e-com pharmacy business the other day, and I said an example. I said, person, uh, say I, if I were to buy, for example, a cream off of your website for myself, what kind of communication would you be sending me? They responded, well, we would be sending promotions, things like that. Okay, what kind of promotions? Well, promotions for other products, for women, children, things like that. And I paused. I said, I, well, I'm Stefano. I, I'm, no offense. I, I don't, I'm not really interested in, in cream for children because I have no cream. Um, so why would I really care about that, right? So the moral of the story here is really you have to start 
to personalize our communication with our prospects and with our customers to revise that repurchase, that cross sell, or that upsell, for example. And the third reason why you should start segmenting your database, you really don't want to understand what your valuable customers are. Who are they? What kind of characteristics do they encompass? So you can start attracting more of them. That really, that's, that's the goal, right? How can I attract more of my best customers at the end of the day? So now we understand why it's important to segment your database. What types of models should we start being, uh, starting to use? And there's different models out there, everything from demographic to geographic to behavioral. Um, but I like to use this matrix as an example because it really encompasses a couple of those models. So as you can see, uh, I want to segment my database depending on fit and interest. So there's high fit, there's high interest, there's low fit, and there's low interest. Each business will be different, right? But this is an example, for example, of a B2B business, where say their best customers today, they know for a fact have 50 plus employees. And they know for a fact that they have revenue more than $5 million. They also know that obviously you should be talking to the DM or the decision maker, right? But you can start building out these characteristics really depending on your business and those profiles of those customers to really figure out who your good fit customers are and what they look like. Um, using this example, I want to really know what these characteristics are for these best leads are and what kind of actions they also have taken, right? So have they opened up an email I've sent? Have they seen a pricing page on my website? Have they downloaded specific content? Have they, have they filled out specific forms? What kind of actions have they really taken to show interest in my company? my product or, or really my service. So we can start building really a lead scoring strategy per interest or action that the lead, the lead has taken, um, not just for my prospects and my leads, but also for my clients as well. Um, and I'll talk about more about client segmentation in a little bit. Um, but once we have these characteristics built out for my marketing team and for my sales team, you can see my screen, the, the green quadrant really is my priority number one. Right, those are, this is for my, both of my teams, really should be the majority of what my sales and marketing team are spending their time in. Because, because these are high and high interest and they're really ready for it to start a sales process. Or they might be even on, be in that decision making stage. So my marketing team should be rotating these leads to my sales team. Um, hopefully there's a SLA or service level agreement built out, um, but they can start working them as well. So that's my first priority. My second priority well, is the yellow quadrant, right? This is where they're still going to be high fit, but they need to start being nurtured by my marketing team to gain more interest in my product or in my service. Mm -hmm. What is important to note here is the yellow and the orange quadrants are leads and prospects that really at the moment are not ready to buy or not ready to start the sales process. And hey, that's okay. That's totally fine. But I want to be able to know that so I can build a great communication, a great experience from the beginning for these leads or for my database. Because if I know that, I'm really able to build a process to nurture them, to make them move from quadrant to quadrant, from life cycle to cycle, um, from stage to stage. Leads coming in, and this is something that we really have to know, is leads coming in are not all ready to buy, are not all ready at be, going to be in that decision making stage. And we really need to realize that most are in that investigation consideration stage. The question is how I can start nurturing them to move them to stage to stage. Um, so priority number one for my sales and marketing team is that green quadrant. Priority number two is that yellow quadrant. Third is that the orange. But also knowing that red quadrant is really important as well because I want to know where to spend my time and where not to spend my time. Um, from obviously from a sales and marketing perspective. If I know that, um, well, I'll be able to disqualify and really create another type of list to nurture the red quadrant, um, maybe with a newsletter or maybe with more of like a low touch communication as the leads won't be buying in the near future, but maybe in the far future, right? So this is how I wanna be able to start segmentating my database. This could be new or can be old from a database I already have. And I challenge you um, to use this framework to really build out this matrix for your business to know where to spend your sales and marketing time, okay?
Not sure if there's any questions here. No, this is really um, useful. I completely agree with you. Um, in my own experience, I, I see all the time too that um, um, usually the approach, especially for email marketing, for example, is to send the same mm -hmm. email to everyone. And uh, maybe for small databases, low volume where, you know, you don't have enough people to segment in this way, um, you can get away with it. But if you have a big one, right, a big database, and you want to really improve the numbers, I completely agree with you that uh, at least you need to um, differentiate from the right feed to the to the low feed. Or in some cases, probably you have seen this, um, you might have more than, you know, one type of buyer as you were describing and it would be better to segment based on the type of buyer that you're sending so that's that's great um uh i i really like it one question that i have and probably you will cover later on is um mm -hmm. what um usually you do recommend to do with um in terms of engagement with with uh the portion of the, your, your database that is definitely just not a good fit right now um have you find, you know, that uh, in some cases, eventually they become a good fit or is something that after a while you um, um, remove from the database? What have you seen on that space? Um, I don't think I would be removing uh, any of these leads from my database. Maybe if it's patched, I don't know, a year and all the um, engagement or communication that we have sent to these leads, there hasn't been any opens or clicks or things like that. Um, maybe we can set those leads to a side, but I think we should be really still focusing on re-engaging these leads. Well, right now they're not the best fit, but in the future they can be. And for my for my time here at HubSpot, I've seen that firsthand. Um, when I started HubSpot uh, almost five years ago, the first what was the squad? Some leads are really not a good fit for HubSpot. Um, and what happened? two, three, four years later, they came back and they bought, right? Because they were still nurtured by HubSpot. They maybe grew in size um, or were hitting those characteristics where they could be classified as a good fit. And then marketing was nurturing them and then putting those leads in front of me, right? So um, I think you should still be engaging with these leads and there's different ways to engage with these leads. Um, I would not discard any of these leads because in the future, they could be good fits for your, for your customers. And once they are, you want to make sure that they know you. They want to make sure that they you know you as a brand, as a product, as a service. See you as the most important. Okay. Another thing awesome. that I, I probably um, yep. um, I have seen that actually happen to HubSpot, right, is that maybe your own product change in a way that now those that were not a good fit anymore um, in the past are a good fit now because you have the offer, right? That's true. That's true. Maybe you're a maybe you're a company who has produced a freemium model and you didn't have that before. Yeah. Maybe you're a software company where you've now uh, created different packages, change your pricing. Um, maybe the barrier entry is not so high anymore. So a lot of changes, right? In um, so like you mentioned, you still want to be engaging those leads because maybe you are offering a uh, lower priced product or service where these leads could be a good fit for. In the future. Sure. Yep. So once we have built out that framework, how can we start um, to not just build out lists to nurture these leads and prospects per quadrant or life cycle stage, but also how can we nurture our clients as well? Um, I speak to a lot of businesses where they're starting to do this with their prospects, but when it comes to their clients, they really don't use that same framework. Um, for many businesses that offer or sell, say, more than one product or more than one service, or across segment, nurture, and create processes to incentivize that type of behavior. Um, a lot of companies I speak to have more of a reactive approach, right, when it comes to this. Um, and this should really be a big focus um, for companies to grow because it's really low-hanging fruit for them and for their marketing and sales team to be able to find these types of opportunities. Um, like I mentioned, a lot of companies that I've talked to have that reactive approach where they send an email here and there to their clients, and if they come back, great. Um, but they really don't have that proactive approach. Um, 
owners today to grow their business, what they want to do is they don't want to be incurring more costs. They don't want to have to hire more salespeople or marketing people or, or invest a lot in their and a lot more, for example, in, in pay-per-click. But to get to their goals or to overpass their goals, they want to do that without incurring those. So they need on CAC and LTV. They need to focus on cost of acquisition and lifetime value. These KPIs, um, businesses need to measure that and they need to focus on that because this is not only a way for business to grow in a more scalable way, but it helps that business retain and delight your customers to make them a lot more sticky to your business because now that client has more than one product or more than one service for, with you and are more entrenched um, in your company, right? So, so what is cost of acquisition and what is um, lifetime value and how can we start measuring that out? So to explain cost of acquisition, lifetime value, um, I'm going to be using my dog Barkley as an example. Um, so let's say me, so um, it's the family dog, it's not my dog. Um, let's say me, I'm buying Barkley, my dog's dog food in an online store, in an e-commerce, for example. Now, if this e-commerce was smart, they'll be following up with me in, say, two to three weeks. Why? Well, because that dog food is running out, right? So this e-commerce doesn't only want me to come back as Stefano, as the owner of Barkley, to repurchase that dog food, but they also want me to come back and buy other products, say balls, toys, collars, beds, treats. You get the point, right? So for any business in any industry, in any part of the world, there's two ways to grow. The first is capture new clients. And there's so many strategies to do this. You can do inbound marketing. You can do paid ads. You can do non-scalable ways like referrals or word of mouth, uh, traditional ways like events, radio, billboards, things like that. And in my experience, these are really uh, what most companies are focused on. Why? Because when I talk to companies, when, they, when they're thinking about growth, they think about, all right, I have to capture new clients, new clients, new clients. They aren't wrong, but they're really missing a huge area of growth, which is that second wave of growth. Their current clients are their install base. Your current clients that have already bought from you in the past, you have to get them to rebuy. You have to get them to cross-sell and upsell, obviously pertaining to your business model. So back to my example. So if this e-commerce or if this online store were to segment and nurture me as Stefano as a buyer, for Barclay, to me, not just only making me want to rebuy that same dog food, but maybe upsell me on a better, more expensive dog food, or even cross-sell me to buy the other products that I mentioned to you before. So if I, for example, am a client of this online store and I have a value, let's say I have $20, because that's what cost me to buy that, that, that dog food, the idea is to increase that value. That it is increased that from 20 to 40 to 60 to 100 to making me be uh, retaining me as a, as a current client, but increasing that value of your current, current clients. And if I'm able to really build out a proactive process to nurture, segment, and attack my install base, which is that low hanging fruit at the end of the day, I'm able to increase that lifetime value of my current clients without incurring costs or having to hire. Right. And then I'm also able to lower that cost of acquisition. Why or how? It's because they're already a client. I'm already a client. I'm not spending me as a company or me as, a, as an online store anything in acquiring Stefano because Stefano's already a client. I'm not spending time on paid ads, on salesperson time. They're already a client. Hopefully they're happy that they're already a client. So I'm getting more out of my current install base. By not, have, by not, by not having, having to basically incur costs. And that's what really a CEO should care about because if you are able to create a proactive process with your marketing, sales, and service team, then at the end of the day, you're really able to build a, a winning team. Now, I talked about marketing and sales, but how does that relate to services team? I'll give you an example. Say I'm a sales rep um, and I've sold to you, Emilio, uh, three months ago, right? Say that you bought product A. You, Emilio, came to maybe our support or service or account management team because you had a question or had a problem. Now, 
if we as a company have sold a product or service, another product or service that can help you resolve that problem, Emilio, or help resolve that question, my account management team should be reaching out to me, Stefano, the original sales owner, to notify me that they have talked to you, Emilio, and that you came by asking for something specific, but maybe product B can help resolve that and I should follow up, right? So many companies today that I work with, when it comes to um, that, that, that customer service piece, they have that 1-800 number or many people in companies in Latin America, most that I deal with have that WhatsApp number. So how are my teams able to communicate through this? Do I have to physically, Stefano, as a, as a sales rep, go into my colleague's phone to see what that communication was? No, that's not scalable. I'll give you another example. I spoke to a cybersecurity software company a while back, and I asked the director of sales, director of sales, how are you and your sales team aligning with that services team? He mentioned, oh, yeah, we talk uh, when we walk by through, through the hallway. <laughs> what? You talk when you walk through the hallway? That's so not scalable. And that's the point I wanted to highlight. I want, you want to make sure that your internal teams are able to communicate, to implement, to deliver, and service your customer in the best possible way. So by segmentating and nurturing your current clients, your sales team, your marketing team, and your sales and your service team can start creating that muscle to incentivize that repurchase, that cross-sell, and that upsell so at the end of the day, you're able to increase that lifetime value and you can lower that cost of acquisition by not incurring costs. And that's the goal, right? Now, how does that look from an automation perspective? Before I get into that piece, any questions on what I just talked about? I, um, if there's anyone if there's anyone that is, um, you know, want to make a question for Stefano, please do so in the question section. I, however, have a comment on that, you know, supporting the, what you are saying. As you know, we um, usually start our uh, work with clients around lead generation. And one of the tactics that we use all the time at the beginning while we build content and all that is paid advertising, as you will know. And mm -hmm. uh, I couldn't agree more with you is I have, I have not seen yet, um, uh, widespread that uh, tactics like paid advertising, for example, can uh, bring back the whole value of the effort through customer acquisition, right? Uh, you know, it's expecting that, uh, especially if the brand is new or if the product is new or you are not established on the market, you're new in green marketing or something like that. It's very rare to see that you get dollar by dollar on paid advertising. But however, it does open the door, right? Mm -hmm. And the, what I mean by that is that, um, a fraction of those um, uh, visitors, leads, opportunities will become customers. And if you just stay there, you will never justify a campaign like that. But if you do what you are saying, right, is the, um, the out of every customer, there are uh, there are nine, um, you know, 19 uh, contacts or prospects that didn't buy right now, but they're in your database right now. And that's usually what I'm trying to uh, to um, convey to our clients is that paid advertising or con even content is your ticket to get access to the prospect and to mm -hmm. start a journey. And when you close them and when they buy more from you and when they finally refer other clients to uh, new prospects, that's when you recoup all that investment, right? That's when you finally get um, that uh, return on investment because I consider all lead generation efforts like the when you are doing a fire, like the Kindle. I don't know if I'm saying that word correctly, right? But you have to have the wood, and the wood is that effort, right? It's how you build up that relationship over time. Um, uh, because if you just sit and wait, obviously uh, you are not gonna get the result you're expecting. Exactly, and that's what most businesses should be focusing. On. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying stop acquiring new clients, but stop thinking that's the only way for you to to, to grow, right? Um, and it's in your backyard. It's the low hanging fruit. It's how can we eat when customers buy also delight those customers. When's the last time that someone has recommended you something, um, a company or a good experience or a bad experience? Um, a lot of companies today also grow through through that word of mouth, right? 
um, through having that good reputation. Um, so that's also really, really important. Okay. Great. So um, when building out or how does the automation piece look like when building out these flows or say workflows, you really first need to figure out who your ideal customer is, right? We say buyer persona um, and what kind of characteristics do they have? Going back to that matrix that I showed before, once you have that built out, what kind of actions can someone possibly take that will show interest in your product or new service that you offer? Maybe if you want to historically go back to the current clients that you have and see what kind of actions that they take, that they, 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 they took when they became a customer. Um, so once that has been defined, what kind of triggers will warrant uh, a lead to be nurtured? And you can focus on that lifestyle, that, that life cycle stage or that buyer's journey. As you know, any lead is really in three different steps or stages, the awareness, the consideration and the decision stage. So a prospect that is in this, an awareness stage needs to be really in a different kind of nurture flow than a prospect that's in, a, in the decision stage. So make sure to really build that out. Don't create hundreds of flows because tracking and reporting on that won't be fun uh, further, further along. Use the KISS principle, the K-I-S-S, -S, or keep it simple, stupid. Um, um, but make sure you build out that, that, that process and that base to uh, really build out that, that customer journey from start to the end. Um, and there's really multiple triggers that you could use. Um, one can be when a lead has seen a page view or downloaded a content. Um, so you can send them more relevant content, moving them more along those quadrants that we spoke about in the beginning. Um, if that leader prospect is a blog or newsletter subscriber, what kind of actions or nurturing uh, processes are you gonna start um, building out? Maybe when a sales rep closed a new customer, so you can keep your customers engaged. So you can continue on that right of that excitement train, right? Um, or maybe when a sales rep has uh, marked something as closed lost, and there can be many reasons of closed lost opportunities, not the right time, pricing reason, competition, whatever. But you should also be able, to, you should also be nurturing and reengaging those leads in time because you never know. Things always change. Um, another trigger you can do is not only just triggers externally, but also internally. So uh, maybe notifying a sales rep on a potential hot lead because that lead has a, had a specific action or seen a specific pricing page or uh, um, had a specific trial or engaged in a specific freemium play. Or even when there's an opportunity of an upsell or cross sell, maybe me, Stefano, uh, sold to you email three months ago and you have product A and you came back in our site and saw content about product B. Why aren't I notifying that sales rep, Stefano, look, Amelia just came back, checking out content about product B, why don't you follow up to hot lead, right? There's also triggers that can also start um, building out internally, not just externally. You can also build out a flow or trigger um, based on NPS, right? Net promoter score. So you can retain your happy and your unhappy customers. Um, so with these flows, you're nurturing, but you're also covering all your bases from everything from pre to, to post sales perspective. Um, so, so in summary of what we've talked about, when you're generating leads in a database for your customers, you really have to make sure you're firstly creating a base to segment your prospects and customers. Secondly, you really want to make sure that you're having all your internal teams aligned to create that proactive process to really incentivize that repurchase, that upsell and cross sell, which will then help you lower acquisition um, and increase lifetime value. And lastly, lastly, it really makes sure that you define your triggers um, and nurture these leads and customers to move them along your buyer's journey. So you, you as a business can at the end of the day grow better. Um, so that's what I had to talk about today. Um, not sure if there's any other questions. Yeah. Oh, thank you, uh, Stefano. I, I love the one that you mentioned about the MPS. That personally, for me, it's a big one. Um, I, I um, and, and a good example of there's always something to do, right? Even when something happened or don't happen, or it's mm -hmm. happening a positive way or a bad way. For us, for example, uh, usually uh, we have that 
um, flow, right? Waiting and we routinely ask our clients, are, how do you feel about the service? And um, when it's positive, obviously we follow up with the, uh, would you recommend us, right? Mm -hmm. On the, uh, in this case, with um, the HubSpot client, we we talked about the directory, or in general, you know, our our review system. But when they're obviously when they're not happy, uh, you want to know why, and uh, and that triggers also a conversation. So uh, I, I I think, and I don't know if your experience is right, that even for uh, awareness consideration decision, not when a, the client is a client, you always have that decision, right? This. It, those that have interacted, you follow up. Those that haven't interacted, then you uh, find different ways to get them back or understand what they're uh, trying to accomplish. There's always a way um, as long as, as you are relevant. Exactly. And when you are creating that flow, for example, NPS, um, you want to, if you have a good NPS, what kind of process you're building out to make those good, happy customers case studies? If you have a bad NPS, what kind of processes or what kind of roll up um, are you creating internally to address those issues, right? Um, so that's also really, really important. There's tons of triggers that you can really build out, but having that base and those triggers built out pertaining to your buyer personas, your ideal customers, um, and what, what stages they'll be in is just really, really important. Right. Uh, let me see. I think we have a question here uh, from Dana. She said, and um, probably is not going to be seen on the screen completely, so I read it. Uh, Can you give examples okay. of nurturing uh, a lead for a product or system that has a longer sales, longer sales cycle? For example, an mm -hmm. automated system in a manufacturing plant or water treatment system for a utility that has, you know, between 18 and 48 months sales cycle it's a, a big purchase, right? Something between 700K and 5 million. So um, uh, this is a this is an example of, you know, sell cycle is too long, probably the timing. I, I guess, Dana, um, that uh, if when I have seen these examples, the, the, the buying or the purchasing window is a specific one, right? Maybe at the end of the year while they're building budget and then you are done. You have to wait for another year to have an opportunity. Exactly. So knowing that process is really important. Um, but what I would recommend is working with your sales and marketing teams. So what kind of outreach and what kind of communication are your sales teams doing? What kind of outreach and communication are your marketing teams doing? What kind of nurturing content, things like that, pertaining also to the actions that that person has taken. Um, so also that's also really important. But going back to that matrix of fit and interest, what's that interest or what those actions that they have taken that shows me that they're in that product or service. Um, and if there's none of that, what kind of content and things like that have they downloaded to nurture them along that process. Also building out a sales enablement um, team internally is also really important. So what kind of um, content that sales enable team can give to that sales team to communicate with that prospect during this long process. Um, but make sure to check in and nurture them throughout that whole process. Obviously you don't wanna be going months without talking to them. Um, because you never know what happens. Yeah, something uh, in my case, something that I can comment on that, what I have seen successfully is when you have those kind of uh, processes where, where the sell cycle is too long, usually the, the buyer, not the buyer, the, the, the seller, the company that is trying to reach to these clients already know the cycle, right? They know that there's a time of mm -hmm. the year when someone will be exploring options because they are building their budget. So what I have seen successfully, and I don't know if you have seen it too, Stefano, is yes, automation can be built upon what your prospects do on your website, but it can also be done based on what you know they will be doing on the real world mm -hmm. anyway. So, for example, can yep. be, you know, if they are building their budget around August, between August, September, and be, because, you know, they're going to make a decision around October to lay it out at the end of the year or the fiscal year is different for them. Then you start for the ones that you have on database, you start sending those emails, triggering, popping that question, right? Is are you ready for this um, uh, event? Another another good way that I have seen uh, um is for these kind of purchases, sometimes there are life cycles for the equipment or the of, or the of the product itself, right? It's something maybe that you need to replace or reevaluate every five years or something like that. 
So you might trigger those events, right? Say, you know, equipment that is, is five years old, need to be replaced or need to be um, um, redesigned or whatever. And those might be opportunities to spark the, oh, I need to do something about this. And then you discover uh, uh, need out of the people that actually open the emails, maybe visit the website, and then you can follow up with your normal or more automated um, outreach. That, and uh, I think you also you, you, you hit it right where, where I was about to talk, but also you mentioned not just pertaining to their actions and interests that you can start building these flows, but also that you said mentioning that, that this company, the seller, knows that process. So maybe month one from month six they're working with the finance team maybe month seven to month i don't know 12 they're working with a procurement team maybe from month this to month this they're working with the service implementation team right so um also knowing that process we can start um implementing flows and nurturing campaigns per who we're working with throughout that whole process as well yes very well well i think we don't have more questions and um uh, Stefano, I really appreciate your, your time today. I, I really enjoyed this conversation and hopefully it will not be the last one. And everyone, thank you for attending uh, this uh, webinar either today or later on in the future. It has been a pleasure. Have a great day and see you later. Thanks for having me on, Emilio. Thanks. Bye. Bye.